My child arrived just the other day. He came into the world in the usual way, but there were planes to catch. And the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when. We'll get together then, son. You know I'll have a good time then. Since retired, my son's moved away I called him up just the other day I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I could find the time You see, my new job's a hassle and the kids have the flu We'll get together then You know we'll have a good time then Hello there, welcome to Inquiring Minds. My name is Doug and I'm back with another Pen Resurrection Sunday video. Today's fountain pen back from the dead is this 1945 Parker Vacuumatic in Silver Pearl. Those of you who watch these resurrections will know that I restored one very similar to this just a few months ago and then, in a fit of madness, I sold it. That Silver Pearl from 1946 was the first Parker Vacuumatic I had restored, and it started me down the rabbit hole of collecting and restoring these marvelous pens from the 1930s and 40s. What I like about them is how sturdy they are. Parker made them with some very thick celluloid and a very efficient filling system that accommodates a large amount of ink. The sections were screwed in, not glued or shellacked, and the only piece of the pen that didn't age well was the Vacuumatic pump sack. Can you say pump sack on YouTube? Oh. Parker changed the Vacuumatic to the Aerometric filling system in 1948. I'm not as fond of the Aerometric filler as I find they accommodate a lot less ink, are more difficult to fill, and are a pain in the ass to clean. Can you say pain in the ass on YouTube? I don't know. Parker also phased out the Vacuumatic around 1948, and gone were these incredible pearlescent stacked celluloid bodies and caps. Fortunately, between 1933 and 1948, Parker made thousands of these beautiful fountain pens. And because Parker made these pens like a Sherman tank... Get off the tank! Stay off the tank! Get off the tank! There are still thousands of them around for us to collect, restore, and write with again for another 70 to 80 years. So come witness the rebirth of another gorgeous Silver Pearl Vacuumatic from Parker, right now. And here is what the pen looks like today. Now I'll show you what it looked like when I bought it on eBay. And it's time for another vintage unboxing. Let's open it up. And here they are. There's a silver pearl. Vacuumatic and the black Vacuumatic. Let's take a look at the silver pearl. Let's see if we can get a date code on this. Might be pretty faint. Yeah, it's very faint. If anything at all. No, the imprint is pretty much worn off. There are a few nicks here and there that I can polish out. Some teeth marks. Ooh, nice big tooth mark right there. The clip's in good shape. And the nib looks like we've got some science projects living in there. <laughs> But the nib looks pretty good. No dings. And it's already pretty gold. Well, that's old. <laughs> squeaky, squeaky. Crunchy. Mmm. Crunchy. It's hurting dogs around the neighborhood. So that's a circa 1940, say 45 to 48. Something like that. So a 1940 double jewel and a 1945 to 48 vacuumatic in silver pearl. 
vintage restorations to look forward to. And now I'll show you some time-lapse video I made of parts of the restoration process, and I'll be back with some history of this pen and a parts and features overview. I've taken the pen apart, and um, I still am a little confused about the date. Here is the nib, and it has a date code here that says apostrophe five dash one dot. I've never seen that kind of a date code before on a Parker Vac. This particular Parker Vacumatic had to have been made between 1945 and 1948. They didn't make the vacuum fa Vacumatic in the USA after 48. So that date code is confusing. But I'm thinking that maybe that five, especially because it's an apostrophe five, means 45. Uh, that's what I'm going to go with. It looks like this nib was original uh, to the pen. The barrel, of course, has no markings on it because it's all worn off. Let's go over the uh, condition of this pen now that I've got it disassembled. Uh, the barrel's in pretty good shape. Uh, it's fairly translucent. There are some significant dings on here that I'm going to try to micromesh away. Uh, the cap hasn't got any major scratches or gouges on it, but it is cracked. Uh, there's beginnings of some cracks right there, but there's a crack right through, right there. There we go. You can see it there. Uh, the good thing is that this celluloid is really sturdy and that that cap band is not just decorative. It's holding this celluloid together, but I'm going to polish that up as well. I took the, the clip and the top jewel off. And the clip is in really good shape. It's all tarnished, of course, and the top jewel is in really good shape. The feed needs to be polished and cleaned. I cleaned a little bit of that fungus out of that feed, but it still needs to be cleaned some more. The blind cap has some significant tooth marks in it that I'm going to polish out. The section's in really good shape, just needs some polishing. And the vacuumatic pump works nicely just needs some cleaning up and that pellet is still in there so I'm going to use my Dremel tool uh, to drill out that pellet and there's the siphon tube full of ink I'm going to take a guitar string and run it through there as well to scrape out any of that old ink and I'll come back with all these parts in polished up shape Now we polish up the metal parts of the pen with some AutoSol metal polish liquid. And I use my Dremel tool to drill out most of that pellet. And I'm gonna try to gouge out the rest of it with this dental probe. There, got it all out. Now I'm going to put the pump back in the barrel so that I can put the blind cap on so I can polish the barrel. And I can put the blind cap back on so that when I polish it, I don't get any rounded edges. So this gouge is way too deep for micromesh, so we're going to have to get rough with it. Now some 400 grit. So here we are after a thorough going over with 1500 micromesh and I got most of the gouges out. You can see those teeth marks are gone and now we'll move up the chart to polish it up. And here's the barrel after going through all of the micromeshes and some polishing compound as well. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. See lots of very good transparency there. And here's the barrel after the same treatment. Looking very nice. So now we'll put the sack back on that pump filler. So I tend to use both my pellet pushers, one from the Inky Nib and one from the Pen Dragons. The Pen Dragons one has the right diameter 
to hold that sack while I'm folding it back. And this one has a better pellet cup uh, to push that into the cup of the pump. So let's do that first. So a little bit of a disaster when I was trying to push that pellet into the cup, the cup exploded. That's what happens when you have 75, 80 year old parts. Uh, it tends to shatter sometimes. So what I did was I took the vacuumatic sack out of this beautiful black vacuumatic that I recently restored. Uh, but this one, while I was writing with it, another disaster happened and that tine snapped right off. See that? So I'm going to grind this down, I think. In the meantime, I put the vacuumatic from the silver pearl into the black one and replaced that vacuumatic in the silver pearl. So now we can move on, but I'm going to have to order another vacuumatic pump. I've successfully installed the replacement vacuumatic pump in the barrel and I've polished up both the cap and the barrel with some conservators wax to make it really shine and i put the nib back in the section and polished up that section now i'm going to reinstall everything take the filler tube push that in as far as it will go i'm going to add a little bit of silicone oil to those threads and we'll reinstall the section this has lots of fine threads and there's no need for any shellac. It was never shellacked in place in the first place. Put the blind cap back on and we're good to go. Now we just need to fill it up. Just keep pumping until you have no bubbles. And we give this a try. It has cleaned up beautifully and looks close to brand new. I've come to love these vacuumatics, not only because they can be restored relatively easily to perfect working order, but because I've discovered how nicely they write and feel in the hand. I used to think these incredibly short sections would be impossible for me to write with for any length of time. Then I discovered that when the pen is posted and I move my grip back slightly to the barrel, I have perfect balance and a nice thick smooth grip for a very comfortable writing position that can be sustained for long writing sessions with literally no hand fatigue. I'm not sure whether this was a typical writing grip for people back in the 30s and 40s. Probably not because they were all so well trained in penmanship as it was required class in junior and senior grades. I know my dad who grew up in the 1940s took penmanship and got straight A's. The proper grip of your pencil or pen was drilled into you back then even if you were lefty you were forced to write with the proper grip in the correct right hand. Here's my dad's autograph book that he got, I think, for Christmas in 1938. You can see Billy Rathbun, at 12 years old, was pretty good with a pen. His older sister wrote him this note. Dear Bill, when you slide down the banister of life, don't forget me as a splinter in your career. Your sister, Freda. Nice sentiment. And here's a nice sentiment from his mother Mary, my grandmother. Dear Bill, there is a destiny which makes us brothers. None goes his way alone. All that we send into the lives of others comes back to our own mother. It's a nice thought from the greatest generation that is beautifully preserved in a lovely and elegant handwriting. It isn't just the restoration of an old instrument so it functions again that's so fascinating about these old pens. It is that they seem to be imbued with the stories they wrote and experienced in the last 78 years. As the date coat is worn off the barrel of this pen, I'm speculating from the nib coat that this pen was made in the third quarter of 1945. Let's think back to what was happening June through September of 1945, shall we? The war in Europe was over, with Germany surrendering on May 8, 1945, using Eisenhower's Parker 51 vacuumatic fountain pen to sign the papers. June 21, 1945. The Allies won a major victory in the long and bloody battle for Okinawa. July 5, 1945. General MacArthur announces the liberation of the Philippines. July 14, 1945. Italy declares war on Japan. Well, better late than never. July 16th, 1945. The world's first nuclear detonation took place in New Mexico. August 6th, 1945. Hiroshima was bombed, 
resulting in nearly 150,000 dead. August 9, 1945, Nagasaki was bombed, resulting in nearly 80,000 dead. August 15, 1945, VJ Day, Japan surrenders. September 2, 1945, Douglas MacArthur signs the instrument of surrender aboard the USS Missouri with a Parker Duofold Big Red fountain pen. And during this tumultuous period in world history, this Parker vacuumatic was made in Janesville, Wisconsin. Since this is essentially a post-war vacuumatic, it has the typical celluloid pump rod and lacks the extra metal of the end jewels of the pre-war vacuumatics. Of course, this is a replacement vac pump as I broke the ebonite cup of the original. And I borrowed this one from another vacuumatic until the replacement arrives. I got the pen replacement from Pen Parts online. So this pen will have a brand new brass vacuumatic pump, which should last for decades longer. This silver pearl has some nicely matching hardware in this silver plated brass clip and cap ring. The clip is the split arrow style with the blue diamond representing the Parker lifetime warranty. Holding the clip in place is the black plastic finial jewel. I prefer this Art Deco style clip over the later Parker arrow. It just says mid 1940s to me. Big hair, shoulder pads and double breasted suits. And the cap ring is not just decorative. As you can see it's actually holding this cap together as there is a small crack in the end of the cap right there. The cap comes off in one quarter turn. Boy, modern pen companies can learn a thing or two about pen design by looking at the pens from Parker from the 30s through the 50s. Let's take a closer look at this nib. It's a 14 karat gold Parker arrow nib where the nib slit is obviously hand cut. If you look carefully there, you can see it's off center. It says Parker USA and under the section there, it has 14K and that odd date code. The cap posts deeply and securely, although I'm very careful with it now because of that small crack in the cap. Unposted, the pen is very comfortable and very nicely balanced. Now let's look at some size comparisons. And here is the 1945 Parker Vacuumatic Silver Pearl with a 1940s Parker 51 Vacuumatic, a 1940s Waterman Stalwart, a 1940s Eversharp Skyline and a 1940s Schaefer Balance. Now let's look at them posted. And here they are posted. This Parker 51 from 1947 has not been restored yet. This Waterman had a broken nib and I ground it into a stub. This Eversharp Skyline broke into a million pieces and I've glued it all together just for posterity. And this beautiful Carmine Red Schaefer Balance is just as tiny as the Eversharp Skyline. Now let's look at them unposted. And here they are unposted. You can see that the balance is a tiny, tiny pen. Not that these are huge by any stretch, but the 51 and the Vacuumatic are a good size unposted. Now let's look at some measurements and I'll be back with a writing sample. And we're back with the writing portion of the review. This is Claire Fontaine 90 GSM paper and this is a 1945 Parker Vacuumatic Silver Pearl and it has a 14 karat gold nib and I'm going to call it a fine. Let's check the wetness decently wet. I was very pleased with how this nib wrote after a little bit of work and it's very smooth with some good feedback as you'd expect from a vintage fine nib. And the ink is of course Waterman's Serenity Blue. As to line variation well, it is gold and it is vintage, so you can press a little bit out of it, but it's not a flex nib. So you have to be careful with it, but it has a good amount of bounce to it. A really nice, juicy, fine, vintage nib. And the line this nib makes is 0 
millimeters, which makes it a Western fine or a Japanese medium on my Richard Binder line width chart. And for our quote. And some reverse writing. A lot more feedback, but it's not scratchy. It's a lot thinner and a bit drier. Not bad. And for some quick writing. Yeah, that feed keeps up very, very nicely. No issues. This was another live and learn restoration. I learned that if you're going to attempt to restore vintage pens, you have to experience breaking a lot of pens. I've broken a few gold nibs and had some plastic sections just completely collapse in my hands when I thought the pen was fixed. I always knew the 70 year old ebonite cups on vacuumatic fillers could be fragile, but this is the first one that exploded on me. In future, I might widen the opening first with a Dremel tool before trying to force a vacuumatic sack pellet into it. When the new pump arrives, I'll put it into this pen and reinstall this pump into this black vacuumatic with the broken nib time. That's a resurrection for another Sunday. And there you have it. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and don't forget to ring that bell to get instant notifications whenever a new video is posted. You can also join as a member of my channel for only 99 cents a month and I guarantee I'll answer your comments in the comment section and you'll get cool emojis, badges, and sneak peek unboxing videos as well. And that just leaves it for me to say thank you for watching. And that's all she wrote. I made this.